So we'll move on to bad takes here. And this one is from Glucose Goddess. And Jay, do you want to set this one up? What is she What is she saying in this? Yeah, well, so she posts her, I don't know if she's a CGM or what. I'm pretty sure these are all her readings where basically most of her posts are all about the different, what, how different foods affect her blood glucose. And the assumption that's built in is that anything that leads to a higher spike in blood glucose is harmful. And she talks about this quite a bit. And she's, she's got like nearly 3 million followers on Instagram. I mean, this is a huge influence right now in the health and non-health world. I mean, it's hitting mainstream people too. And something that I, as we'll get to, I mean, I think all of us think is, is particularly harmful. And uh, yeah, so we'll let her share this post and go from there. And we will, I'm sure we'll dig into more posts of hers in the future, uh, digging into kind of other aspects of this, but this is a good starting one. You want me to read this top part? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the best way to eat potatoes for our glucose levels is with the skin on. The skin is the or original clothing. The skin contains fiber, and fiber slows down the absorption of glucose into the blood. This idea of eating the skin applies to fruits and vegetables. If you can, keep it on. Also, if you put some clothes on your potatoes, you're all set. Slide for details. <laughs> I did a bite in there. <laughs> just gonna be, this next video is just going to be us three just munching on watermelon rinds. And like with our CGNs <laughs> on, just like, oh, look, our blood glucose is great. Yeah. So, so yep. she's... You, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, can you just start with the blood glucose one and then we'll come to the study after because there's actually a really interesting aspect to that study. Well, the, the, the last one? Yeah, yeah, the second slide. Oh, second slide, sorry. Uh, put some clothes on your carbs. If you're eating carbs on their own, bread, corn, uh, couscous, pasta, polenta, rice, tortillas, cake, candy bars, cereal, cookies, crackers, fruit, granola... Oats, hot chocolate, ice cream, or anything else with sweet. Combine them with fiber, fat, or, and or protein. Any vegetable, avocado, beans, butter, cheese, cream, eggs, fish, Greek yogurt, meat, nuts, seeds, a smaller glucose spike, no crash, two hours after eating, less insulin release, reduced inflammation, steadier mood, better skin, happier organs, happier heart, uh, reduced type 2 diabetes risk. And then we've got that, yeah, that second slide there with the... So, so what she's showing in this one, her kind of main... The, no, the this one right there, yeah. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> the other one, Danny. <laughs> I'm too fast for you guys. <laughs> you are. So this is like the main, this is her main post here, right? And then she's explaining it. But this is the main one, which is that mashed potato, which I'm assuming is just plain potato with nothing else in it, led to a bigger spike than the potato with the skin. That's like the, the highlight here. And so she's saying, eat the skin, it's got fiber. And the whole her whole paradigm is built around this idea that it nearly doesn't matter what it is if it leads to less of a glucose spike it's better and if it leads to more that it then it's worse and that's we'll talk about details for like in this example but just in general it's an extremely myopic lens that misses all of the other aspects of health and physiology and what actually is going on underneath the blood glucose what actually is driving blood glucose spikes or non-blood glucose spikes and also if somebody is struggling with blood glucose spikes, it's often not food related, it's insulin resistance related, or they're not actually using the carbohydrates effectively and just favoring things that lead to less of a spike isn't fixing the problem at all. But when you're coming at it as the problem is, like what drives the problem is glucose spikes and insulin release, it leads to this result. And it's, it, it just kind of, it drives people to a number of really harmful Ideas. One is that everyone needs a CGM to manage their glucose spikes and to be constantly monitoring. And any glucose spike is inherently harmful. And whatever you can do to minimize them is better. And obviously, the extreme of that is a low carb diet and fasting, where you're going to have a constant low glucose uh, level. Of course, you have like a spike from cortisol in the morning and things like that. But otherwise, it's going to be pretty constant and low. And obviously, there's huge negatives to that, despite a balanced, so to speak. It's not balanced, it's just a low blood sugar. And so that's, I mean, that's the biggest point I wanted to highlight first is just that this is missing out on so much. And the, I, the skin here, the potato is a good example, just like the skin of other potential vegetables. Like if you just throw in a bunch of fiber or raw vegetables, sure, you're going to slow gastric emptying and potentially lead to a, uh, a slower increase in blood glucose. Also, the fiber itself will slow down that absorption. But you're also getting a ton of anti-nutrients, for example, with a lot of those things. And it's one thing to have, let's say, some version of a cooked vegetable versus just having a raw vegetable. And if we're only looking at the blood glucose response, we can say, oh, well, raw vegetable's fine without considering oxalate issues, phyt phytic acid, phytic issues, lectin issues, whatever it is, saponins, goitrogens, like a ton of things there. 
So the biggest point I want to at least start with is, ju is just that we need a much larger context than what is the effect on my blood glucose from this food versus that food. I Does she it, really rec recommend ahead, everybody yeah. use a CGM? Is that like a common thing that they recommend? I don't know if she recommends that directly. I'm a, I would guess she does, but I don't actually know. Got it. Got it. Go ahead. I mean, but that's the extrapolation, right? Like how else are you going to know this data? Yeah. It's yeah, kind of implied, it. right? Like this is all the precision medicine stuff that everybody's talking about now that it's like, oh, you need a CGM. You need to do your gut microbiome all the time. You like all these different metrics. And it's not to say that some of these things can't be helpful at some times, but the basic point is like the myopic nature of some of these things. Cause you go, you know, you listen to Gabrielle Lyons and it's like, oh, it's protein. And then like, as long as you eat enough protein and you like work out, you're good to go. And then this lady's going to talk to you about your blood sugar. And it's like, these are singular modalities that you can look at to try to see what's going on with health. But there's so much more to the picture and it's about taking multiple elements together and, and then basically creating like a system for yourself that's based off of your experiences with yourself to find something that works. So maybe that is adjusting your protein intake and your carb intake and your fat intake and using red light and then whatever supplements work for you. And then making sure that you have, you know, if you're dealing with blood glucose regulate dysregulation coming off low carb or something, not getting massive glucose spikes or something like that for that period of time. But this is just not, this is not the one and only thing that's going to make the massive difference to people's health. And again, like it becomes myopic to just say, oh, just have all of the, you know, keep all the fiber on board, keep all the, keep all the skins on the fruits and vegetables and things like that to lower your blood glucose. And it, it gets to a crazy point, right? Cause this was the whole argument for the low, the whole grain stuff. The whole grains mm -hmm. argument is just, oh, you need to have whole grains because they don't spike your blood sugar as much. It's like, yes, because they have a bunch of things in them that impair your digestion of those things due to their food matrix. And then your blood sugar doesn't spike as much, number one, because you don't absorb as much. And then number two, because it's way harder to absorb. I think people forget primarily that the reason you're eating food is, is to actually get nutrient, whether that's micronutrient or macronutrient. So I don't think, like if somebody was worried about their blood glucose spikes with eating potatoes, say you're type two diabetic, say you're coming off of a low carb diet and you're trying to introduce carbs again, and your body's still burning fast. You're not used to it. You have that transition. You don't have to eat the potato with skin so that that doesn't happen. You can have some meat with that. You can have a bit of butter in your potatoes. You can have like the raw carrot with it. You can have some fruit on the side and all of those things will change your blood glucose response. So, like as far as that goes, I think that, you know, glucose goddess, I don't know her name would probably be on board with that idea, but the idea that we're just man we just need to manage the glucose spikes and it's more valuable to eat potato skin and watermelon rind, which obviously I'm joking, that's an exaggeration, but watermelon rind just to manage your blood glucose, I think misses the point. Like just have your carbs, have your, your potato or whatnot with your meal, have your steak and potatoes and whatever else. And like, you're good to go. You don't have to eat the skin and you do want to absorb the carbohydrate. You hundred percent want to absorb. You don't want to be doing things that are going to impair your carbohydrate. And it's the same thing with diabetic drugs, right? It's like, oh, take a carbose. We'll block all of your carbohydrate absorption. Oh, look, your blood glucose values are better. And it's like, yes, because you didn't absorb your carbohydrates. And now we're in a worse spot because now you didn't absorb the carbs that you're eating. And now you're still just burning on fatty acids and upregulating gluconeogenesis because you didn't have the insulin spike, which is another thing that I think that gets misconstrued here is that insulin is not a bad hormone. Insulin is, is a good thing. Insulin is signaling the lowering of the stress hormones. And when you have super elevated levels of insulin, I'm not talking about getting an insulin spike after you eat. That's normal. What I'm talking about is if you're chronically elevated with insulin, where you look at these studies and you say, oh, diabetics insulin levels are this or obese insulin levels are that. That's not because they're just slamming so many carbohydrates and the insulin is just spiking. It's because they have dysregulation dysfunction at the cell. And that dysfunction at the cell is impairing the response to insulin. And then the levels are driven up because of this dysfunction, not because of this, this, the carbohydrate in and of itself. So I think if you get into this myopic perspective, then you start to miss the forest for the trees and you start telling people, well, you don't really need the potatoes. You just need to eat the potato skins or you don't need to have carbohydrate at all. I'm not saying she said that again, that was an exaggeration, but you get to like a perspective like Rob Wolf's where it's like, oh, if I don't have any carbs at all, my blood glucose is flat all day long. I don't have any blood glucose spikes at all. And it's like, yeah, you don't have any blood glucose spikes at all. Congratulations. You're running on gluconeogenesis to maintain your blood sugar, which is coming at the expense 
of your metabolic health. So sure, you can go ahead and do that if you're heavily focused on a glucose spike, or you can recognize that eating carbohydrate, raising blood sugar a bit, and having an insulin response is completely normal and what you want to happen to lower those stress hormones over time. There's a huge cost to ignoring some of these things. So as you said, for one, some of the anti-nutrients are direct amylase inhibitors. So they Im impair the breakdown of the starch. So you're just getting less of the carbohydrate, which you could accomplish that with much less downside by just eating a little bit less potato. So that's one thing to consider. Another thing is we're ignoring all the other aspects of nutrition that drive insulin resistance in the first place. So if you eat a bunch of fiber and you have SIBO, you have a bacterial overgrowth, you produce a ton of endotoxin and an irritation in the intestines, that is going to create an insulin resistant state long term and cause a ton of damage long term. And this is clearly implicated there. And but your blood sugar spike with meal. So it was better. Like we're completely ignoring so many aspects of health by excessively focusing here. And it, and it, it comes at a major cost. And uh, again, as I was saying, if you are insulin resistant, this isn't a fix. This is just a band aid. And it's a harmful one as well. Like you were we're ignoring potentially harmful aspects of nutrition or potentially majorly harmful things like a low carb diet just by focusing on a glucose spike. And this gets really clear because her whole thing is we need less glucose and less insulin. And when we look at that study, that first slide that she has, there's a really great quote in there because can you pull Can you zoom in on that, Danny? Cause what she always suggests in addition to like having your mixed meals is having your protein and fiber first, and then having the carb second, because that leads to less of a glucose spike. And she cites this study in this, in this post. Um, and one of the quotes from it, I, I can't hear this. Let's try on the, this. Danny on the bottom. I have it written down so I can, we got it. We got uh, it. I can we got it. read it out. Yeah. So it says emerging evidence suggests that pre-meal consumption of non-carbohydrate macronutrients, i.e. protein and fat preloads can markedly reduce postprandial glycemia. And it says, here's how it does it. By delaying gastric emptying, enhancing glucose-stimulated insulin release, and decreasing insulin clearance. So we've talked about delaying gastric emptying being a potentially beneficial thing, depending on the context. But the exact thing that she's saying is harmful, which is more insulin and more interaction between insulin and the cells, is what happens when you eat protein before the carbs. So you get less of a glucose spike. But it's because it actually causes the glucose to increase insulin further. So you get a bigger insulin release from the same carbohydrates you would have consumed. And it decreases insulin clearance. So that same high level of insulin is hanging out for longer. So the exact opposite of what her stated goal is of lowering insulin, because insulin's the bad guy, is what it gets accomplished by her recommendation of consuming protein before the carb source. I think they're saying protein and fat, right? Protein and fat, yeah. Because I think the fat is what impairs the insulin clearance and whatnot. Because the the fat, if you're right. burning fatty acids at the cell, then the, the cell won't pull in the glucose in response to insulin. And then the, when the insulin isn't pulled into the cell, you don't get the degradation of insulin. So you just get more insulin floating around, essentially. Right. So, again, it, it's not to say that you can't have your... Again, we're not saying that you can't have fat and carbs and protein together for your meal or that eating a steak and potatoes and having some fruit after the meal is problematic. It's just that the, what you're saying, Jay, is the mechanism by which he's saying here is all this benefit in terms of controlling the blood glucose spike to just lower insulin or something like that, or, or what, what have you is it's like counter to what her goal, her stated goal is, or what the implied goal is with this type of perspective by leading to elevations in the fasting insulin level. Uh, and postprandial insulin. Yeah. But, but it's not even that because she, like what I'm also, or in addition to that, I should say, is you don't need to make sure you eat your steak 15 minutes before your potato. Like that's not the solution here. And it actually goes against what she is suggesting is good, which is low insulin. So, I mean, we'll dig into more of her posts in the future because there's a lot here. But um, yeah, I think, you know, I think we highlighted some of the important points here. And I, one thing I want to point is just the nuance that's important here is I don't think anyone's saying that, like, again, because I, I see people watching this and being like, oh, they said that you can't have your protein and your fat and your in your meal with carbs and things like that because it's going to make you insulin resistant or affect your insulin levels or things like that. The main piece that you're saying here is just the focusing on blood glucose levels and blood glucose spikes and the insulin stuff by itself is quite myopic and not the complete picture and it's like kind of an understanding of the overall thing that's going on that and, and and in conjunction with understanding that there's more factors 
to pay attention to, especially when you're making a recommendation to eat potato skin, which is known to have the higher contents of the alkaloids that are poisoning and things like that. What we're essentially saying is not that we disagree with every recommendation that could come from this data, some of which is eat a mixed meal with some fiber if you're struggling with blood sugar control. That's great. We don't disagree with that inherently. But it also leads to some really erroneous recommendations like eating the potato skins or like eating the, you have to eat the protein before the carbs to reduce the blood sugar spike. So it, again, it's an issue with the framework and an issue with some of the specific recommendations. As you're clarifying, Mike, this doesn't mean that everything she's ever recommended we think is wrong, but it's a mixed bag because of an erroneous starting place. Yes. The premise is incorrect. The frame for the argument. Right. Yeah. And, and then if you have a problem and you, uh, internalized information like that, you're essentially like colluding with the pathology of the problem to never fix it. Right. You know? <laughs> like, right. So it's really important to try to find the best information possible, you know, and all of us could attest to like uh, skipping through multiple modalities before finding something that made sense. But um, that's less of a problem these days because the information we're sharing now, like wasn't even available like uh, t 10 years ago, you know, so it's, it's, and I'm sure we all talk about things that we wish we knew, you know, and so that's um, yeah, of course. a big, big part of it. If you enjoyed that clip, you'll definitely want to download the free Energy Balance Food Guide. The Energy Balance Food Guide will help you determine exactly what to eat to optimally support your metabolism and help you lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, boost your energy, and so much more. The Food Guide makes it extremely easy to get started with a bioenergetic approach to optimizing your health. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash guide to download your free energy balance food guide.